honor you. God, there's none like you. We lift up your name. We say, have your way. God, we yield to you. We submit to you. We say, have your way. Change us today in your presence. Shift us in your presence, God. Pour your glory out on us. Have your way. We come for you. We come for you. Speak to us, Holy Ghost. Speak to us, Holy Ghost. Release your word in this place. Release your word in this place, God. Your word that accomplishes. Your word that changes. God, your word that shapes a thing. Your, your word that made something from nothing. Release your word in this place. Make it a session for us today. Quiet every voice. God, quiet every voice, every distraction, every wandering thought, every whisper, every lie of the enemy, every incantation, every generational thing. In Jesus' name, let it be silenced. And you speak. Let us hear your voice behind us saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Show us how to walk, God, for your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Show us where we should go, how we should go. We just want to follow you. Father, I pray for an anointing that makes preaching easy. That makes hearing your word a sweet delight, God. I pray for every heart that it will be good soil, ready to receive your word. And you, Lord of the harvest, you cause it to grow in Jesus' name. Amen. got your Bible we're going to be in Luke chapter 19 about verse 28 now this particular story it is in all four of the gospels Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and I would suggest you read all four because they all carry slightly different details to add to what God is saying and doing here. It says this in chapter 19, verse 20, it says, when he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, and it came to pass that when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, Olivet, I don't know, <laughs> that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on it. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. This is the thing about worship. And the song that they were just singing is, Even if I can't see it. You know, he didn't come on a stallion. He came on a lowly donkey. And even though they couldn't see it, they knew their king had come. Didn't look like he had an army behind him. But he had angel armies behind him.
Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The other gospels uh, declare that they were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who came in the name of the Lord. Somebody say Hosanna. Hosanna. Some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, saying, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Uh, think that there's a crowd yelling Hosanna. Blessed is the king that comes in the name of the Lord. And from the same crowd, there is a shout to the same God receiving praise, saying, tell them don't praise you. A lot can happen in a crowd. That's why you gotta watch who you're sitting next to. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. You may be seated. There's a lot can happen in a crowd. I'm going to kind of go off script a little bit because I hear something else in my heart. <laughs> I'll get back to it in a minute. Uh, my wife and I watched a documentary the other day on Freak Nick. <laughs> hey, might as well kick the door open, right? <laughs> and um, and, and it, how many of y'all know what Freak Nick is? Okay, seven of us. Cool, don't worry about it, and don't go look it up, because there's some parts of the documentary you have to fast forward through. <laughs> Freak Nick was a festival that supposedly started out as like black spring break. Back in the 80s, when people would take spring break, uh, historically black colleges and universities and things like that had students that, that necessarily could not afford or would not go to the beaches. And so what they started doing was gathering together. <laughs> it changed from a gathering together in 83 to a uh, sex fest, if you will, by 93. To where... Tens and tens and tens of thousands of people would, would gather in Atlanta and, and they would just park their cars in the middle of the street, get out and walk the streets of all of Atlanta and shut it down and it would just be a freak neek, okay? <laughs> Not like a picnic, freak neek. Um, when you have large crowds gather for stuff like that, it sets a climate in the region. That's why Atlanta's music sounds like it sounds. And these type of things happen all around. If you get to Woodstock, I mean, y'all are familiar with Woodstock. That's on the other side of Atlanta, but the same things that, 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 that became a problem for Freak Nick was a problem for Woodstock, which is the rape culture, the sex culture, the drugs culture. Now, now here's, here's the crazy thing is that Atlanta is in the Bible Belt. But not one preacher, not one church, not one prayer meeting, not one gathering of the saints slowed down the momentum of Freaknik. It only came to a close when the Olympics came to Atlanta in 1996 because now you got to clean it up because you got international money. Which now goes to show you where the city is yielded to. Who is the God of the city that they yield to? You can't serve both God and mammon, scriptures say. They wouldn't remove it for morality's sake, but they would remove it for money's sake. And for the Olympics, which is made after Greek and Rome of Olympia, so there are their gods. Um, but it sets something in the atmosphere. We have to understand that then. I say that because something happens in a crowd. We have to understand that here, that we have a particular warfare that we have to fight. Um, 
I told my wife this morning, I said, it feels weird in the air. Stale, if you will. Uh, dusty. Where is the Lord? And, and I told her, I said, I, said, I said, you know what it is? I said, I said, during their new moon festivals right now, this is what's going on. Uh, now, we understand what we are honoring when we deal with, with Palm Sunday or we deal with the resurrection. But we do also understand that they pin these days on top of their new moon festivals. And, and it's, it's unique that during the time of these new moon festivals, Florida hosts a, a bunch of festivals as well. Uh, people think they're coming down for some of your ultra fest. Is that here right now? <laughs> you think it's coincidence that they are here during the new moon? They think they're here for music, but the organizers are here for worship. You'll get the glory. You'll get the praise. You'll get all of the honor. This is what we sing, but it's what they sing. During the whole time, there's also spring break that takes place during these new moons. Uh, when did taking a break from being busy with classes turn to not remembering the last seven days? What kind of vacation is it that you can't remember your vacation? That you need an IV the next day to, 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 to rehydrate after your vacation? That spring break became synonymous with uh, people so drunk on the beaches that they can be sexually violated with no repercussion. Well, because when you worship in such a fashion, um, harlotry in the temple, temple prostitution was a custom. Something happens in the crowd. So now here we go. We are here trying to exalt God and praise God in the midst of other worshipers in our region trying to set a climate as they worship the wrong thing. So it is, it is, it is of the utmost importance then that we understand what we come to do. Uh, this morning, I, I led corporate prayer. Do y'all know corporate prayer and leading prayer is not the same thing as praying for you? If I'm praying for you, I'm touching and agreeing with you, praying for you, and, and you're in agreement in your spirit and receiving prayer. But leading prayer and praying for you are not the same thing. Leading prayer is similar to leading worship. Prayer is not something that, 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 that when, when it's done, that, that you sit and are the audience of it. So if someone is leading prayer... They are just the one that is in the front that is leading a thing, while everyone who is with them is also following in the same direction. So if I'm praying because I'm leading prayer, you're praying as you walk as well. There should, there should not be only one voice heard in an atmosphere of corporate prayer. I say that because we have to be intentional during these times about why we came. And we can't walk into an atmosphere, no matter how much we feel like we need it, uh, and rest and, and put it on someone else to take us into the glory. We got to be willing to get there ourselves. No matter how tired you are, no matter how stressed you are, no matter how distracted you are, you've got to call every thought into order. You've got to bring things and submit them to Christ. And you've got to walk it out and say, you know what, it's no one else's job to get me there. Because no one else will be there to be blamed when we, when we stand before him. Because, listen, 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 listen. The, why you know why no one else is going to be blamed? Because God keeps his word. So there's no way for you to put it on anyone else. Let's jump into this. Um, Israel. Somebody said, not my son. Israel, God has met every obligation to Israel that he has said. Now, we all know that, that we are Israel. And not just spiritual Israel, but we are, are, are most likely 
bloodline Israel. We don't have to go into that teaching right now. We don't have to get banned on YouTube, but we all know what we know. <laughs> However, at this point, that makes no difference. Uh, why do I say that? Because this is why Paul tells us don't waste time in endless genealogies. Because all of the needs that need to be met for Israel are met. This is why uh, who is a Jew? Is he a Jew who is a Jew inwardly or a Jew outwardly? Why? Because all expectation for Israel has been met. Say what you mean. In Genesis 12, and this is why there's no excuse, because God meets his word. In Genesis chapter 12, you see the promises that are given to Abraham. Right? There are three promises that are given to Abraham. Y'all know what they are? You'll be a great nation. Yeah. Francis said they don't know it. <laughs> That's a fact. One, one says, he, said, he says, I'll make you a great nation. What comes from you? Be a great nation. He says that, that I'm going to take you into a land that I show you so there's a promised land. And he says that through your seed, I'll bless all the nations. These are the promises to Abraham. God met them. He met them. So now he owes physical Israel nothing. That's a hard teaching, ain't it? Because you have, you have pastors um, that stand up in their pulpits and still uh, declare that we have to stand with the state of Israel. Now, the state of Israel and the nation of Israel are two different things. We don't have to get into that because we don't have to get banned on YouTube right now. <laughs> but here's, here's what the scriptures say. One, he said he'd make them a great nation. Uh, and, and that's in Genesis 12. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, here's what God says in verse 5 and 7. It says, Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely... This great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us for whatever reason we may call upon him? So God speaks to the prophet at the time to say, you are a great nation and others will recognize that you are a great nation. So when God said, I will make you a great nation, by the time you get here, guess what he has already done? Made him a great nation. When he tells, when he tells them, I'm going to take you to a land that I will show you. When Moses dies and Joshua walks them over the Jordan and into Jericho, and they take this promised land that's filled with milk and honey, guess what they got? A land that he would show them. Uh, when he says that I'm going to bless all the nations through your seed, enter Jesus. That was 2,000 years ago. Well, all the requirements for the promises made to physical Israel were met. So there'll be no blame because God is not slack, the scriptures say, in keeping his promise. He don't wait, he's not waiting to the last minute to keep his promise. So we see three promises given to Abraham about Israel. But in those three promises, there's one promise for the earth. This is what we await. The one promise for the earth is that uh, this one promise is going to fix it all, that Jesus is that seed, and he's going to save both Jew and Gentile. This goes all the way back from, it goes from Genesis 12 back to Genesis 3, where there's going to be enmity between the seeds. This is the seed that the promise comes from. Now to that promise, here comes the bride. And this is where we start at in this particular verse. Uh, because he's getting ready to walk out this course. They're screaming, Hosanna, save now. Somebody say, here comes the bride. Comes the bride. There's a new move going on in the country right now. Uh, God ain't with it. God ain't into polygamy. Y'all know that, right? Oh, that's the big thing right now. You know why? Because men like to have what they want. I don't know why no woman would put up with it. But they out there putting up with it. 
<laughs> Let me tell you who don't put up with it. The Lord. God ain't into having many wives. Why is the spirit of, uh, that, 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 that introduces polygamy running so rampant in America and on the television and all over the internet? I'll tell you why. Because there has been the same spirit now for generations trying to convince us that there are many ways to God. If he's coming for a bride without a spot or wrinkle, uh, if you don't want to be part of that bride, you think you could be a part of another bride and still get to him. Uh, but that's not how God moves. There are not many paths. This is a harlot's mindset. Here's, here, 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 so let me, let, me, let, me, let me prepare the bride a little bit. Y'all ready? Yeah. The bride and the harlot. Here's the, the difference in the mindset. A harlot deals with oppression. Oppression stops where Jesus reigns. Uh, the anointing of the Holy Ghost is to release the oppressed. So he's not going to deal in an oppressed mindset because it stops where he reigns. Wherever you submit to him and resist the devil, the devil has to flee. You know, you can't be oppressed by the world and be an ambassador for Christ. Now, you can say you're a follower of Christ and still be oppressed, but you ain't ambassador in nothing. Because when you are in, in authority, you are not bound up and subjected. Now, you may be able to be at war as an ambassador, but you can't be a victim and an ambassador. Scripture says that weapons that are formed against us don't prosper. And it is a harlot's mindset. It is another wife's mindset. It is a polygamous mindset, if you will, to be oppressed, bound up, subjected, not, not favored, not loved, not in a position that you are called uh, to say that, that you can be oppressed. This, this is the danger of the modern political movement, is to convince people that they are oppressed. As if Jesus came to make sure that you are financially okay. As if Jesus came to make sure you have equal rights. As if Jesus came to make sure that there was never racism. This is not what he came to save us from. He came to save us from sin. And the wages of it. But when we turn Jesus into politics... Now we need the church to, to stop being this type of bride and, and split itself into factions to bring multiple brides to him. And we turn Jesus into political Jesus. We turn him into community service Jesus. We turn him into activist Jesus. And before you know it, we got polygamous Jesus who has multiple types of brides. Oppression. Uh, that's, 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 you, to have a mindset where you have to convince people they're oppressed so you can be their savior is anti-Christ. Uh, because you can't oppress someone who is freed by Christ. Oppression, you know where it comes from? It says deep. From an oppressor. You know where employment comes from? An employer. <laughs> this, is, this is deep. Um, but freedom comes from a savior or a liberator. So who, uh, whoever has rulership over you is who you receive from. So if Jesus has rulership, oppression is not your basket. It's not your portion. Freedom is your portion. That's why you can't convince me that what other people say about me puts me in a position or a condition. What he says about me puts me in a condition. If he said I'm free, then I'm free. You can say this about me all you want. All you're doing is painting a picture for your own mind. And because you can't keep me out of anything he's promised me, you can't oppress me at all. You only can keep me out of stuff you offer me that I desire. So we have, we, we have this mindset. Another mindset that we get in and, and we find ourselves splitting is, it, it's, it's amazing how, how, how we yield to the world. What we should yield to God. We know, we know how witches move. 
And when I say witches, I'm talking most of the world. Most of them. They move in covens. And they are loyal to their covens. It get quiet in here when I start talking to somebody be like, am I, am I in a coven? <laughs> <laughs> loyal to their covens. Let me tell you something. You can't, you, it's hard uh, to try to get a witch to back away from her loyalties to the other people in her coven. But on the side of the kingdom, you can't get a believer to hold any standard in a covenant. Like, you know, it's the same root word, coven and covenant. God gives us a covenant. The world gives them a coven. And there is no loyalty in the covenant. We are not loyal to, to the one who instituted it. We are not loyal to the other people he made it with. We are not loyal to the standard of his word. You can't get a witch to come to your church, but you can get a believer to come to your coven. Oh, wow. Believers can't wait to get to spring break. <laughs> Believers can't wait to get to the bar. Believers can't wait to get to your DM. And then they, they mimic bride behavior. Listen to how, 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 how covens and, 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 and covenants get very close from the world trying to mimic the bride. Jesus told us we are the salt of the earth and the light. I was going there. <laughs> he told us we're the salt of the earth. Now you look at practical magic. Witchcraft. And salt is a big part of their power structure. Jesus tells us we are salt. And we are a big part of his power structure. But the witches will put salt all around them for protection. But a believer can't even find a church to stand in the gap. He told us we are the light of the world. They operate with a false light. They say things like... Love and light. He's love. God is love. Love and light. Christians start wishing people love and light. Jesus came to bring salvation to the world. Watch how the world operates. Because saving the world is a move of God. So now there's an agenda in the world that looks like it's aiming to save the world. The difference is the salvation Jesus brings is for all of us to not have to pay this, this death tax and be separate. But the world and its coventry has, has changed the idea of, of saving the world to physically saving the world. And giving you another cause to chase. There's more people that will march for Greenpeace and going green and climate change and all of this than you can get to come to a revival. And then they'll tell you that if you ain't active in these type of things, then your church is ineffective. Right. Why? Because we're doing what he said and not the same language that you said. And you know, if they make the language close and identical, they can pin the cause of the world on God. So they say things like climate change and go green. And you know what? The climate is going to change. It's going to change big time. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 the, the scriptures say that the sun going to get so hot that it's going to burn men. The scriptures say he's going to pour out his vows of wrath on the earth, that, that the wrath of God is poured out on all the unrighteousness of man, that he's bringing an entire city, his holy city, his virgin bride, the daughters of Zion are coming down. That's a definite climate change. So his salvation of the world is one way. They're saving the world is to prevent this change. Uh, you know what they have done to us is they have made enemies heroes to us. Heroes. Somebody say heroes. heroes. I was watching a cartoon yesterday. 
cartoon. My wife, she goes, not this again. <laughs> but it was Saturday, and I grew up watching cartoons on Saturday. <laughs> and Disney, y'all know where we're going. <laughs> they, I guess they got the rights to X-Men. X-Men 97. Y'all know why they call it X-Men 97? No, no, it, it, it came out two weeks ago. <laughs> but because the original X-Men cartoon ended in 96. It ran for four or five years, it ended in 96. So what they did was they retroacted it and said like X-Men 97 and the cartoons are drawn like they're 25 years old. But it was such a hit. X-Men, these are our heroes. Somebody said, no, no, they're not. Somebody said, if you're a nerd, I ain't even gonna say her name on camera so y'all don't know who she is. <laughs> these are one set of heroes, how's that? Here, here's who they are, you ready? Wolverine. Uh, scriptures tell us that, that, that there are wolves in sheep's clothing. Wolverine is kind of an anti-hero. He is, uh, he's a, I don't know if he's a good guy or a bad guy. Right? Uh, but the scripture tells us that we should watch out for wolves. Uh, you have Cyclops, which is one eye, which is what we see in the world. And power flows from that eye. We see, what happened? Did it get bright or? Yes. <laughs> All right, y'all be praying for me. <laughs> it's a witch in the room. <laughs> it's all right. Stay, stay while you won't be a witch long. Um, all right. All right, pause. <laughs> I have to edit this out. <laughs> We good? All right. Cyclops. Cyclops. There's rogue, which means rebellion. And whatever she touches, she drains power from. There is storm. Everyone loves storm. But she's really just a witch. She, she, she moves through the elements. There's beast. This is X-Men. And these are our heroes. <laughs> uh, you can move through Superman if you want to, who is just a fallen angel. He's not from here. He's from somewhere else. He has a different level of power. They have made our, our, our enemies heroes. Transformers. The Transformers are the fallen. That's why they have a movie called The Fallen. And the last one was called The Rise of the Beast. And they're there to prevent destruction coming to this earth or, 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 or a coming king that will come to destroy this earth. Um, they, are, they, are, they are the fallen. But we make heroes out of them. We put them on our children's clothing. Their lunch boxes, their book bags, and and we we would do that, but would say I ain't gonna make my kid come to church. Not in the covenant, but part of the coven. And then we have made heroes enemies, in the same fashion. And 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 and, and so when you when you have someone coming to bring the end of the world, we know scripturally that that is our coming king. But they have made him evil and everyone roots for him. To, everyone roots for Thanos to lose. Because they paint him evil. Um, look how else they make our heroes enemies outside of Hollywood. Let's go into the political world. I was reading an article the other day that talked about, you know, I, I, the way they word it was just almost insulting, but it said evangelical pastors harp about prophecies for Trump. 
Y'all know what they're doing. And, 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 and it, this, it happened eight years ago as well. That, that, that pastors always got something to say, you know, when it comes. And so the news starts painting it this way, that these evangelical pastors are conservative, da 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 You know why they do it, though? You got to make an enemy out of, out of people who are called to be heroes. And pastors should be wiser than to get out there and throw their mouth behind a system that God does not endorse. But what they do now is you have to paint the, the, the conservative side as with these pastors so that the world can hate God. Because it's the left agenda that's running the world. Uh, then this is not a political left or right thing. Understand me clearly that there was a season where the right ran it. And there is a season where the left runs it. Because there is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There is a checkerboard floor in the, in the occult Freemason world. And you go from dark to light. It is alchemist. It's alchemical in nature. And so now there's a shifting of the spirit of the world where, where for a moment they have stepped away from the right to the left. And on the left side, it's go for abortion, gay marriage, uh, sex changes, and all of these things. And so as, if people are sympathetic to that cause, guess who they're going to hate when they look to the right? right? Not the right, because everyone on the right's really on the left. And everyone on the left is really on the right. They're the same. They're two wings on the same bird. The one who comes out hurt is the church. Because you got to hate the church who stands against the move of your culture. Coven. And you have people who can't wait to post they voted stickers. Ask me who I'm voting for. I don't vote. <laughs> I'm an ambassador for Christ. What I care who this world elect. Because <laughs> it ain't even it ain't election if they choose it. It's just getting your buy-in. And I told my wife this the other day. Let me just talk for a minute. Watch how this works. Someone say, well, someone fought for that in the military. I was in the military. So now you're going to use nationalism and, 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 and worship of the country to make me buy into the system. Or someone's going to say, uh, 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 someone's going to be disappointed. You know, you know, black people, we had, to, we had to march and do this and this to get equality. So now we have to participate in ancestral worship. So I have to participate to honor the, my dead ancestors. The coven. It just looks political, but it is not. There is no system in the earth that is not spiritual. Every system has a spirit root. And, and it draws you to one or the other. Parents raise children and lie to them. I'm not going to get into all y'all personal business <laughs> about all the stuff you're lying about. But let's just go for the big days. Christmas. When did you decide to tell your kids Santa Claus wasn't real? Somebody got mad right now. Santa Claus ain't real? It don't matter if they was one, two, three years old before you, before you told them, you know, you decided to impart lies into your children for the sake of a holy day. Painted eggs with them. Gave them chocolate bunnies. Parents impart lies to their children for the coven. Rather than stand up for the truth, for the covenant. How do holy days encourage lying? Wow. Then we, 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 we understand things without understanding them like, well, you know, the elites want this and the elites want that. How many of y'all heard that recently? The elites, the elites, the elites. Somebody say elite. elite. You know, it's funny. I was sitting there thinking of the elites. And I wrote it slowly. Because when you write it slowly, it's the elites. 
like a people. They told us the word was elite, but it's the Elites. And El is the God of Canaan. So these Elites that run things in Hollywood or run things in different nations serve the God of Canaan. El uh, in Hebrew means God. And so when you hear it in reference to the true God, you will hear, uh, it'll say the Lord God most high, which in the Hebrew it is Jehovah, uh, the most high El, Jehovah El Yon El, El El Yon, God most high. So they can call their Molech, their king, they can call him El, but Jehovah is El Elyon. They can serve Elohim, we serve Jehovah Elohim, the most high God. But we all have raised children and ourselves want to rush to be part of the Elites in society. Somebody say, here comes the bride, though. I said all of that because God ain't into polygamy. So here's what happens now. Let's get back to Jesus. (laughs) Well, we meet him in scripture here. He's getting ready to go be crucified. He's got about a week left. And he knows it. In fact, at one point in one of the Gospels, he, he makes a statement to his apostles and his disciples that are there that had you known what the cost for your peace would be. He said, even now in this day, if you knew. And he's, he's, he, he's, he's, he's already knowing that they are unaware of what is about to happen. But he knows what he's going to do. But there is a cost. There is a cost. The sleep is a cost. When God made... Eve, he put Adam to sleep in order to bring Eve out of Adam. Jesus understands that if he's coming to get his bride, there is a sleep he has to go through. This is what happens on the cross. I've preached this a million times before, but this is what happens when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Looks at Mary, says, woman, behold your son. It's for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother to be united with his wife. Jesus on the cross is, is, a, wedding, is a wedding ceremony. It's also him doing what he came to do. This is where Eve is found for Adam is that Adam, while he, he is, 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 is naming the animals, is when God decides, hey, it's not good for him to be alone. It's when, this little, little, little marriage advice if, or to single people, if you want to get married and you want to have a spouse, do what God called you to do. It is in you operating in the calling of God that your spouse or helper or help me is found. Eve was with Adam the whole time. She just was here. But it was in him operating in the call that God brought her out of here and and he saw her differently one day. You can't find your spouse outside of the call of God when the reason that you have a spouse is for the call of God. Now, you can find a spouse outside of the call of God, but not your spouse. Now, once you make a spouse your spouse, you're stuck. Because God is into polygamy. <laughs> so, so my advice is let there be a little patience. Jesus is now doing what he's called to do where, where the bride is going to be pulled out. And while he's doing what he's called to do, it is obvious that there is none suitable for him. This is what God did with, with Adam. He brought all of the animals and there was none found suitable. When Jesus is on the cross, where are the apostles? They have all fled. Where are the worshipers? There are none found suitable for him. And so he has to pull the bride out of Christ and make the bride suitable. It was was him that made us suitable. That's what the scriptures say. 
uh, without a spot or a wrinkle, without, without blemish. It was him that he presented us to him, radiant to himself, that he did it because there were none found suitable. He presented us to him, and then he named us. It was what Adam did to Eve. He named Eve. This is the problem with the church is we want to name ourselves. We want to identify. We want to say a thing instead of this is what God has called us. Therefore, this is what we are. Uh, what God has said is it. Let, 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 me, let me tell you how magnificent God is in his, in his telling of, of us. He tells a story. He says, uh, the kingdom is like in the two ten virgins. Five had oil and five didn't. Y'all know the story, yeah? Um, when the groom comes, five with oil get up and run to, to, to him. But he ain't polygamous. How he got five virgins? And that's the kingdom. Five. Y'all ever thought about this before? Me neither. <laughs> because I ain't never taught this series before. <laughs> but now I'm sitting here thinking like, how is there five? Why is there just two virgins? And, 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 and let me give you some understanding. There are all five virgins in this story, but there's only one bride. So who are the five virgins? Now we got to identify them. And I spent time pondering, Oz. And I spent time studying and chasing and looking. And I got to know a thing. I mean, Lord, I got to, this, it don't make no sense. It don't make no sense. Make it make sense. <laughs> and here, let, 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 watch this, watch this, watch this. Abraham is married to Sarah. Right? And Sarah is called the mother of all nations. She's one. She has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. This is why she's the mother of all nations, because all the nations came from her. Jacob has 12 sons by four women. Rachel, Leah, Bilhah, Zilpah. 12 sons by four women. That's four wives. Or four, that's four nations. Four virgins. Where's the fifth one then? What the scriptures tell us? That it's us. It tells us that these 12 tribes are going to reign and then these are all those called out of the tribulation. The fifth is the church. The fifth is what Christ provided. Uh, there's a promise of the flesh that is given to Abraham. And there is also a promise of the spirit that's going to be fulfilled later at the time it's given to Abraham. So here's all these nations, but then out of your seed is going to bless all the earth. There is the, there's the branch on the vine, and there's the wild olive branches grafted in. You know, olive branch, uh, it's, it's beautiful because Jesus used the term olive branch because olives are where the oil is. The olives hold the oil, which is why the bride has to have oil. Uh, and there is, there is a seed that moves by the Spirit. There is a physical seed that moves through, through the, the sons of Israel. But there is a spiritual seed of the Holy Ghost. Because the seed comes from the Father. That's why scripturally it's, it's this one begat, this one begat, this one begat, this one. That you were of Israel by your father. Because the seed was in Abraham, and Judah was in Abraham when he gave a tithe to Melchizedek, and Jesus in the loins of Judah, etc., etc. But then there is a seed by the Spirit. The very same way the Holy Ghost moved upon Mary and produced Jesus as the example is the same way he moves upon us to make us new so that we become sons of God. 
Hence, before Abraham, Jesus said, I am. Because he was the promise from Genesis 3 before Abraham heard from God in Genesis 12. But the oil is required. Uh, it's required to be born again, and it's required to be brought in. And we see this with the five virgins, that there are, are the same five, five here is that you could blend in, don't mean you getting in. Um, so you can go and yell about being of the tribe of Reuben or of the tribe of Dan or Gad or Benjamin or Simeon or Issachar or Judah. And if you ain't got no oil, it don't matter. Because the, 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 the oath and the promise to physical Israel has been met. Now you got to come by the oil. Same thing for the church. You can go to church all you want. If you ain't got the oil, you ain't getting in. If you ain't got his spirit, you ain't getting in. And you can have perfect attendance in Sunday school. And you can be here from the time that you was born to the time that you go from the womb to the tomb. It don't matter if ain't no oil. So I don't even understand the idea of having a ministry without the Holy Ghost. Why? I'll tell you why. I'm going to read y'all about seven scriptures. Romans 8, 4 says this, says that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. The righteous requirement of the, of the law is fulfilled by those who walk according to the spirit. Romans 8, 10. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 5. For we, through the spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Ephesians 5, 9. For the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Uh, righteousness comes by the Holy Ghost. This is how we're pulled out of him. And he pours out on us and he presents us to himself clean is because the righteousness of God comes from him alone. He makes us suitable. Amen. Unrighteousness is going to receive the wrath of God. The righteousness is brought in, but it's him who makes us righteous. So, so then the, the, here, here's what I wrote down. And I was telling my wife about this last week because she ministered this at, at worship night. And I told her, I said, I just wrote that down, uh, whatever. Is that righteousness is greater than sinlessness. I see y'all faces. Righteous is greater than sinless. Somebody say, what you talking about? Let me tell you about Adam. Adam was naked, but naked. Is it butt naked or buck naked? Is it butt? I ain't gonna say I'm butt, but I mean buck. I've heard buck like a, like a, like a, like a deer. Like they ain't got no clothes on either. Bucket naked. The boy was stark naked. Naked as a jaybird. That boy was, he was in the nude. That boy was. On South Beach. <laughs> and Adam had no tan lines, the scripture said. No, it didn't. Look, 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 he was naked. When Adam <laughs> fell, the scriptures don't declare that he went uh, from being clothed to being naked. Because that didn't change. What changed was his standing. The same thing he was ashamed of after the fall, he didn't even think of before the fall. So it had nothing to do with his physical condition. It had to do with his standing. He went from righteousness to unrighteousness. He went from standing with God to hiding from God and being separate from God. And, and, and so, so we understand then that, that I would rather be righteous and naked. Uh, scripture say all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Scripture says that our righteousness is filthy rags to him. So it's him who justifies us and makes us righteous in spite of it. Scripture says that where sin abounds... 
grace abounds much more. The, the problem with the, with the, the church of, of, the, of the polygamous idea that there's multiple ways is that church has taught us that we work to become sinless. Rather than he pours out on us a righteousness in spite of our sin. That don't mean go sin. Jesus said go sin no more. But he also said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. I'm only quoting these scriptures so that we understand that there ain't a man in the earth without sin. But there are men in the earth that are righteous. And so we're going to show up before God. And, and we're going to be made righteous by him, not necessarily made sinless. Sin just has no power. Yeah. Anyone who disagrees, just look over your last 24 hours. And then look forward over your next hour. <laughs> because sin is so, so, so sneaky, the mindset of pride or fear or, 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 or how you maneuver around the thing or, or something you knew to do that you did not do. Paul said it's constant, but there is a, a, a different law. So this is, this is the amazing thing where, 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 where I'm, I'd rather stand in the righteousness of God than the sinlessness of man. And God can use a broken vessel rather than one that man has polished. And, 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 and I love this because this is the goodness of God is that he doesn't give us what, uh, what we want. He gives us what to want. So now, if I'm walking in his righteousness, what happens eventually is because he gives me what to want is I don't want to do the things that cause me to sin anymore. But if it's all about God giving me what I want, then those things that I often will chase after will cause me to sin more because it's my pride, my lust, my desire, those things that are being fed. Somebody say God is good. God is good. God is good. A righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up. Not a sinless man, a righteous man. Job was righteous in all the land. Job was not sinless, though. But this is the way it's taught. We act like Job was sinless. But that would make scripture inaccurate because the only one that I know that is without sin is Jesus. Otherwise, Job's sacrifice could have paid the price for us. Job was not sinless. He made sacrifices every day in case they sinned the night before. Hence, he was righteous in the land, not sinless in the land. And the more, the more we, the God gives us what to want, then, then we want more of him. We want to be with him. We want to pursue him. And then we understand the goodness of God, that he is good, not for giving me what I desire, Listen, listen, listen to this. That's not why God is good. If God is good for giving me what I desire, then when he don't give me what I desire, that means he's not good. Therefore, his goodness is not based on what he gives me. Because if it, if it was based on what he gives me, if he ceased to give me what I wanted, then I would not praise him anymore. I would say he's not good. Um, if he meets my needs... That doesn't make him good. Somebody say, why? why? Because he made me. That makes him responsible for me. So if he meets my needs, because he made me and he's responsible for me, that don't make him good. You know what it makes him? Abba. That's right, father. That's what a father does. A father is supposed to meet the needs of what he is responsible for. That's why Jesus said, when you pray, pray, our father. So that don't make him good. That just makes him father. Uh, in fact, we see in scripture, Jesus said, if you being evil men know how to give good gifts, how much more your father in heaven? The gift uh, is good, but the giver isn't when Jesus is dealing with fathers. Because even an evil father meets the needs of his child. Therefore, God meeting our needs is not what makes God good. You know why he's good? I'm going to tell you why. 
Let me get some keys. It sounds better with keys. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. You feel anointed today? You feel anointed today? Ain't neither one of them said, yeah. I said, Mike, you feel anointed today? He pointed at Manny. Manny, you feel anointed today, sir? I start out with the intention of the crowds of spring break and breaking through and what you come to do. Give me something. It wasn't even all. It wasn't even all. Why it ain't all? Ain't no anointing on that keyboard. <laughs> Let me see this one. All right, that's sustained a little bit. <laughs> the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. Though he stumble, he's not utterly cast down for the Lord's hand. Sustains him. <laughs> All right. So look, God, ain't, God is not good based on giving us what we desire, and he is not good based on meeting our needs. What is God good for then? God is good because he gives us what we don't deserve. This is where his goodness comes in, is that he never leaves us, though he should. He has never forsaken us, though he should. That he is faithful when we are faithless. That he stays committed to us when we are not committed to him. This is his goodness, that he forgives us. While we were enemies, we did not deserve that forgiveness, but he gave it to us. They didn't even understand the times that they were in when he was going to get on the cross. There was none suitable, yet he did it all the same. That, that even though he should, he did not. That his goodness and his mercy, his goodness is attached to his mercy. Because you know what we didn't deserve? His mercy. His goodness and his mercy, it follows me, not sometimes, not half the time, but all the days of my life. That when I was running from him, you know what was on my heels? Goodness and mercy. When I was walking in the dark places, you know what was like light to him? Because of his goodness and mercy, that he was chasing me down, not letting me go, picking me up. When I was hating him, he was loving me. This is why he is good. And this is why being without sin is greater than being sinless. Because I am without sin in his presence. That's righteousness. I'm in right standing with him. Even it, Sinless is my work. Without sin is his. Is that no matter what that sin can do, he covers it in his blood. Therefore, yeah, you did it, but you're without it. Yeah, you did it, but the consequences ain't on you. This is the grace of God that you don't deserve. And you know what we get to see from this picture? Let me finally get back to the scripture. He's headed to the marriage. You know what you don't have? A flower girl. There is no priestess dancing down and dropping flowers for him to walk on. Because everyone attending should be part of the bride. So he don't have a flower girl here. You know what he has? Worshippers. They didn't throw flowers down. They took the garments off of their own backs and laid it down. They took their own clothes off and laid it down. The Pharisee questioned the worship. The Pharisees protested the worship. Questioned him and protested the worship. Do you know why? They didn't know him. In an atmosphere of worship, the only reason to protest worship or to question God is because you don't know him.
Your worship is indicative of your knowledge of God. I can tell what you know of him by how you worship. If you can't open your mouth, I know what you know of him. If you can't lift up your hands, I know what you know of him. Somewhere they taught you that he was only good if you got what you needed. Somewhere they told you he was good if you got what you wanted. But nowhere did you really understand that he was good because he didn't give you what you deserved. He didn't give you the death. He didn't give you the punishment. He never let you go. And your worship is indicative of what you know of him. And watch how bad it is. Right before this happens, if you go back and read the chapter, he's telling the, the kingdom is likened to a man who gave talents to his servants. This one, five minas. This one, two minas. This one, one. And he tells this. And, and when he goes to collect at the end, the one with five made ten. The one with two made four. But the one with one said, I knew you were a harsh man who reaped where you didn't sow. So I buried it. Watch what the owner says to him. He says, by your own testimony, I'll judge you. If you knew I was this type of man, why didn't you at least put it in the bank and get interest? Understand this, that even if you have a wrong understanding of God, your wrong understanding of God does not change God from being God. The little that you know of him if you were to judge God by what you knew, still makes him God. You can be mad at God. He's still God. You can say, look what God did to these people. He's still God. That's why he did it. No matter what your understanding of him, he's still God because you can't think him off his throne. So, by your own standards, if you say that, that he's not a good God, you're still saying he's God. So praise him all the same. Praise him according to what you know. Because even bad ideas still make him God. This is why you deal with covenant and covens. Because witches deal in rebellion. And no matter what you think about God, when you're finished with that thought, he's still God. So the only way to get away from the idea that he's God is rebel. And that's why rebellion is the way of the world. Because they can't sit and, and be angry at, at a God that they think is unjust. They got to say he's not God. So they have to go away from their own idea. So this is where rebellion comes in. But he has worshipers. And they laid their garments down. Somebody say change of garments. They took off what they put on. And he becomes their covering because this is the marriage. Because the first Adam put on his own covering and got away from God. And what these did at the last Adam was took off what they put on and cried out, save now. Hosanna, save now. Hosanna means, oh, save or save now. It says, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. What is the name of the Lord? Jehovah. What is Yeshua? Jehovah is salvation. Hosanna, save now. It is the name of the Lord that saves. And this is what they are crying out. And what they declare. Look at what the protesters said, and I'm done. They said, all that you have done, this is John chapter 12, 19, says, the Pharisees said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. This is what worship causes the enemy to understand, is that it is your worship that causes the whole world to go after him. Here is my testimony is that whatever I put on myself has failed me. So I take it off and lay it at his feet. And I cry out to him, save now. My king has come, save now. And that right there is enough to cause the next man to say, save me too. You've been good to me too. 
here, take this thing off. And, and someone's covering was a whole different thing than the other fig leaf someone else was wearing. Someone was wearing pride. Someone else was wearing fear. Someone else was wearing lies. But when we started laying it all down and letting him trample it under feet, then we knew that he was our salvation no matter what we covered ourselves in before him. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And that covering came to the bride. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for covering us God we thank you God for saving us we thank you for preparing your own bride for pulling us out of you for presenting us as righteous for washing us and presenting us radiant to you we thank you God that it's not by our own works but it's by your works we thank you God that you are good to us when we don't deserve it we thank you God that we are part of the covenant and we reject the covenant in Jesus name we thank you God that we are part of the one bride that you saw fit to bring in another virgin into your bride outside of the four wives that brought upon your nations that you loved us so and all we can cry out is Hosanna blessed are you who come in the name of the Lord in Jesus name Amen when you came in you received an envelope the envelope says tithe and offering Our giving here is worship. He didn't make flower girls. He made worshipers. He made us all part of the bride. And so we lay it all down before him. What these worshipers did here on Palm Sunday was they took off something that, that was theirs. It, it cost them something to worship. Worship is a sacrifice. Keeping a tithe is our covenant. And the offering is our sacrifice of praise. Let this Palm Sunday be a day where we declare with our gift, Hosanna. Blessed are you. You've come in the name of the King. There's digital ways you can give if you are watching online. It's on the screen. It is convenient. But it is not casual. Easy. But remains holy. So as you, I always talk slow so you can hear the Holy Spirit lead. Don't let this be an opportunity for you to protest. Because even the rocks will cry out to declare to God. Let this be a time of worship. Let it continue on and let it continue outside of this place. Let it continue through, through your driving. Let it continue through the beaches. Let it continue throughout the next two months we got we got a job to do let me just say that and i'm talking about actual living a life of worship i'm talking singing songs of deliverance and making sure that we give in such a way that it offers worship because because there is a spirit that comes down here that says serve yourself that that, that gathers together that says serve you please you waste on you be for you uh and we want to make sure that we break that over these next two months we're not going to let them set the standard so every opportunity we get, including giving, we are breaking that idea. Father, we thank you for the privilege to give to your kingdom. Everything that we have, God, it comes from you. Father, let us never be idols to ourselves. Let us never serve ourselves. Let us never chase after ourselves and be lovers of ourselves. But let us be lovers of you and worshipers of you. We give you back our tithe, God. We give you back our offering. We give you this small portion, God, and ask you to do wonders with it. We ask you, God, not to just do wonders here in the in the earth. But let it represent something in the spirit that it does wonders to break through atmospheres. Father, it, it, it looks like currency here, but let it be currency there. Let it break through everything that tries to establish a stronghold. Let this worship tear it down in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.